Welcome to the Microgreens Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Jonah Krokmalnik. Together, we'll explore the art of turning tiny seeds into a thriving microgreens empire, sharing insights, coveted secrets, and strategic wisdom from building one of Canada's largest microgreens farms. Stay tuned for thought-provoking conversations with leading figures in the world of microgreens. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's episode, we have Andy Musoff from Fresh Source Farms. Me and Andy dive into running a microgreens business in a small town and the advantages that can provide, the importance of collaboration with other farmers, adopting a continuous learning mindset for your business, and so much more. This episode is full of great advice from Andy's years of growing experience. Let's get right into it. Hey, Andy, welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited to have you on. It's been a long time coming that uh, I've known about you and, and your farm and all the cool stuff you're doing in the education space. So I'm really excited to have you on. Um, and yeah, and I, maybe we could just get started hearing how you first got interested in microgreens and a little bit of your backstory of how your farm, Fresh Source Farms, came to be. Yeah, I mean, uh, my wife and I have always done outdoor gardening. We have about a 900 square foot outdoor garden. She's definitely the outdoor expert. <laughs> That's her her world, man. I mean, she's great with like, especially with herbs. She knows a lot about all the different herbs and uh, the possibilities involved with that and what they can actually do for your body. Uh, but we also grew like a lot of tomatoes, cucumbers, all the basics. Um, but we really enjoy that process. And there's so many awesome farms literally around us where we are. Uh, it's not a very big community. I mean, our city we're in, I think is maybe 16,000 total people, something like that. So it's a pretty small area. Uh, so there wasn't really any advantage to try and compete with those guys because they've got, you know, hundreds of acres mm -hmm. and, you know, we have an acre of, of land, which is still a decent amount, but you can't compete, you know, at that level without really just leveling your whole yard and turning it into a giant garden. Uh, so, we thought, let's do something that no one else is doing <laughs> in this area. So we came up with the idea to uh, try microgreens and just see how it went. I mean, I figured worst case scenario, we're out a couple hundred dollars, you know, worth of racks and trays and stuff that we, uh, you know, had to purchase up front. But it really wasn't too bad in the end. So we were able to uh, start in May of 2020. So actually, COVID is the only reason I'm even doing this. Ironically, uh, <laughs> when it first came on, I was working a regular job and um, got furloughed for three months. So it was right around that time when we started the, uh, the process of the furlough. So I you know, talked to my wife and I said, look, you know, now's our opportunity. We've been talking about this for a while. Let's, let's see if we can make it happen. So we got started and the nice thing is we had three entire months you know, to see if we could get it off the ground. And uh, of course, at the time, everything shut down. You know, there's no farmer's markets, all the restaurants are closed. Uh, most of the grocery stores are kind of figuring out what they're doing. So we literally set up in our front yard. <laughs> we had our own little, you know, private farmer's market to a certain extent, even though it was just us, but we promoted it as a, as a farmer's market and we pushed it out on Facebook and um, started out with just, you know, posts to uh, friends and in local groups and stuff like that. And then we eventually actually started putting like five or $10 a week, nothing crazy in advertising dollars into actually promoting it. And the challenge was, you know, we are five miles from anything. So if I pull out of my driveway, I have to drive at least five miles to go anywhere. Nice. Uh, so I had to convince people to drive all the way down to our house. <laughs> so coming from wherever they were, plus the five miles to come down our road. And it was interesting because when they would arrive, they're expecting regular vegetables, which we had some. Don't get me wrong, but at that time of year, it was May. I mean, there's very little to harvest. So uh, we ended yeah. up basically just bringing out everything and harvesting live. So we had all of our trays out and obviously we handed out samples. And at the time uh, we were trying to start with like two ounce containers and we found that some people weren't willing to spend that $5 or whatever, you know, so then we ended up actually having a one ounce option that was only $3 just to get people started. And uh, but the cool thing was about doing the live harvest is that a lot of people would actually videotape us and post it to social media or take pictures and post it to social media, which was neat. Um, and I literally sat in my front yard for six hours every Saturday and waved to every single car that went by and it worked. <laughs> it was a lot of people that pulled in and they're like, Oh my gosh. All right. You've, you've waved at me like six times today. I feel like I need to come at least see what you got going on. And you know, then you know how it is, you get samples in the mouth and they're a, a lifetime customer. So um, yeah. yeah, that's pretty much how we started. And uh, it was, it was something that we really, didn't initially think was going to be that impacting on our lives as far as like 
we didn't, you know, we weren't proactively thinking like, oh, people are going to literally change their way of eating, you know, as a result of having these for sale. And uh, some people are going to have, you know, cancer results that come back better and they're going to lose weight because of us. And, you know, we hadn't even thought that far ahead at that point. We were just thinking, okay, this is something cool that we can do that no farms in our area are doing. And we just wanted to see if we could make it work. And I'm pretty sure we did. <laughs> yeah, that that's awesome. What a, what a great covid baby story i like a business <laughs> baby story you know like there's it's so like honestly covid as terrible as it was in so many ways and i could tell you for my business it was like in a lot of ways very very difficult just supply chain wise once you yeah. got to a certain scale at that point it was like really hard to get stuff but just like what became of it like people lives changed your your life changed and just like a great business that's all around good for everyone came yeah. out from it and there's so many of those stories and it's really beautiful um, so I, I'm so glad to hear, uh, you know, that, that in, in such a, like a relatively small city or town, you're able to make a business out of it, which kind of leads me to the next question is, um, how have you found any stumbling blocks in being in a smaller size town? Or have you found like, as long as you just market it well, there's, there's not really a big ups, uh, like upside limit on where you can kind of take the business. Yeah, I mean, there's there's pluses and minuses. So the the pluses are the fact that it is a small town, you know. So a lot of people know each other. So you know, mm. the ironic part, and I tell people this all the time, is when you get to the point where you're out in public and people are like, "Oh my God, that's the microgreens guy," and they come over and talk to you about it. That's when you know you've really made it in your area <laughs> because you know we had that happen so many times. And the first time it happened, my wife and I were out to dinner. And a couple just comes walking over, like we're literally sitting there eating dinner and they're like, oh my God, are you the microgreens guy from Facebook? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> can, we, can we please eat our dinner here? I mean, but it was, uh, it was neat to see like that impact, you know, and even literally mm -hmm. this past week, I was at a networking event and like four people came over that I'd never met in my entire life. And I introduced myself and, you know, they were like, oh yeah, I saw your video that you just posted the other day. And it's like, oh, that's cool. So that's the one advantage I would say of having a small town. Obviously the big negative is that you've got limited businesses that are in the area that you can work with. So our, our delivery route on Thursday is probably about eight hours ish, eight or nine hours of driving all over the state, you know, because the, in order for us to reach mm -hmm. the distributors and reach the bigger restaurants and stuff like that, we have to take the trip. I mean, I literally just drove uh, an hour and a half to talk to one grocery store today, you know, because that's, they're within our reach. So, um, yeah, I would say that's the one downside, but at the same time, like it's not really that big of a deal. I mean, if, if I'm doing deliveries, obviously it's costing the business, nothing other than my time. And if I have uh, a person doing them, I mean, they're barely making minimum wage or a little over. So it's not really costing me a whole lot of money to make those deliveries, which is good. But at the same time, mm -hmm. it'd be a lot nicer if we were in like a populated area where we didn't have to go way out of our way to get to all of our customers. Yeah, that that's a good point. Um, in, in terms of uh, like, it, it, it brings me like a, a off topic, but um, I was I was in a small town uh, this last week and I was talking to another business owner, nothing related to farming, um, but she was telling me how like she can post a job and it's a town of like 7,000 people and it could be up to three months till anyone applies to the job because that's wow. how, like just being in a smaller town, it can be more difficult to to, to get staff. So it's just, uh, but th that's a downside, like is, is, is the market smaller, staffing can be more difficult, but you have way lower costs. Like the yeah. rent in the city is, especially now is like insane. Yeah. Um, in theory, <laughs> if you have an acre of land, if you wanted to, you can pretty much, as long as you get permits, you can build whatever you want to produce yep. on an infinite, not infinite, but like one acre of, <laughs> of, of land c converted into indoor space is a lot of microgreens. So um, yeah. you, you, you don't have an upside in terms of production space. Whereas like, if you're in the city and you need to go from like 2000 or even let's say a thousand square feet to 2000, one, just finding a space can be really yeah. difficult, but then two, the cost of that expansion um, with, with the rent in the cities and all the, the uh, construction costs, it, it can really add up to a lot. So being in a place where you don't have that, you already have land or you already have space to grow, uh, which is why it's always best when people start out to grow in their house, because then they don't have any costs associated with it until they run out of space. Um, so, so yeah, just, it, it's great to hear that you've been able to make a market and make it work. Um, but to hear the reality that in a smaller town, there is a smaller market and you do have to go further out. Um, so I guess it, it really depends on, you know, what, what, what you have available. Um, but it depends also on like how much time you have to commit to the business as the business owner, right. Or, or finding people to do those deliveries so that you can yeah. focus on other things if need be. 
and the irony is that we we attempted to build a 60 by 30 building on our property, which is 1800 square feet, which at the time we were like, yeah. we're never going to fill that. I mean, that's like monstrous. And thank God the county didn't allow us to do it because <laughs> we would have outgrown it in about a year. <laughs> I mean, we, oh, wow. uh, we were in a 12 by 18 room in our house. Uh, it's literally yeah. directly below where I'm sitting right now. And uh, our plan was to move out into that. And we wanted to put a bathroom in. And that was really the main thing because we didn't want, if we had to hire people, we didn't want them having to go in and out of our house all the time to use the bathroom. So that was actually the holdup because we are in well and septic and they didn't have enough mm -hmm. septic capability to be able to put in another uh, bathroom. So that's the funny thing. And then we ended up moving out of that into a 2000 square foot space, which was bigger than we were planning on building. And now we're in a 4,000 square foot space because we outgrew the 2000 square foot space. So, you know, it's like if we had, now we'd have this 1800 square foot building on the side of our yard for no reason. <laughs> Cause we yeah. had to move out yeah. anyway, but yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Or you'd have you to said. build another one. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> I don't know that I'd want to do that again. <laughs> with the yeah, cost no, that would be involved in that. Yeah, oh, yeah. But I mean, it's, yeah, that's no. just the, the irony is that, you know, the, the town pretty much shut us down as far as being able to do that. It actually ended up working out for the better. But yeah, I mean, I, I advise people all the time, if you can stay in your house as long as you possibly can, uh, you know, you definitely want to. I mean, Robert Meredith, Meredith Family Farms, he's down in Florida. He had 22 grow racks in his garage. You know, that's a big oh, business wow. inside of and it's still in your house. You know, so that's pretty cool. And he was making phenomenal money. So it's certainly possible. Uh, our, you know, our garage has cars in it and it's not insulated. So it wouldn't have been ideal at all. But uh, yeah. for us, we knew, you know, at the rate we were growing, we were going to need something bigger than even that. Um, so it worked out in the long run. But, you know, moving into a new space is expensive. It definitely is not cheap. Oh, yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. How, how did you find uh, finding the 2,000 and then 4,000 square foot space? Was it was it quite challenging or was, was it, was like, I don't, it, I guess it depends on the local market and the real estate yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Did you find it quite challenging to find a space that was suitable? It wasn't, it wasn't as hard to find the 2000 square foot space because that's a little bit, there's a lot more of those available um, mm. because there's a lot of little shops and things like that around. So, but it's the challenge is finding everything you need, you know, like a floor yeah. drain, is a fantastic thing yeah. to have because you're going to be washing your trays there. Uh, you know, having oh, a, yeah. an HVAC system that works and keeps the the whole building at 72 or, you know, whatever, uh, all year long, having water, you know, even ran to places that you needed to be ran enough electric, you know, to be able to fill out that building. We installed 22 dedicated circuits in the building that we just moved into uh, because and a third electrical panel, because we wanted to fit the whole place out to be ready to go uh, from day yeah, one. So, yeah. you know, that was the one challenging part is just finding, a space that has everything that you actually need in it. So that was the the tough part. And I, I actually did a, um, a commercial space masterclass, if you want to call it that, with uh, Nate Dotson recently. Uh, I think we launched it awesome. late last year. And it basically covers the entire process, you know, from start to finish, dealing with landlords, finding a realtor, you know, that is looking for what you're looking for, the things that's going to cost you money, what's not going to cost you money, you know, so it's like a whole detailed, heavy detailed thing. And uh, it was a pretty cool course. Oh, yeah. And as people are slowly awesome. coming up to that level, yeah, it worked out great. I mean, it's a lot of really good information. Yeah. So, um, you know, we launched that, I guess, late last year or something like that. But, uh, and as time goes on, you know, there's going to be more and more growers that are going to be in that situation oh, where yeah. they have to move out of their house and find a space. So, um, you know, it can save literally tens of thousands of dollars <laughs> by finding a yeah, space that's yeah, ready no, to go. Even something like as simple as a floor drain that you may not think about, you may like, oh, like, I can just water by hand the same way I'm doing now. Yep. But as you scale, like generally speaking, you want to automate more. At least that's my methodology. And I, I believe yours as well, for the most part, is like yeah, do to less. A certain extent. You know, yeah. if, if you can, if it's affordable to do so, you know, if it's yeah. going to cost a hundred thousand dollars to automate, you know, like something super simple, maybe it doesn't make sense. Maybe it does, I don't know. But like, you know, if, if it's relatively low cost uh for the size of your operation, it usually makes sense. So yeah. Um, you know, having a floor drain, like you said, for washing trays, like e even if you don't wash trays with a tray washer and you do it by hand, it's still really nice to have a floor drain. Otherwise you got to pump the water some somewhere else. And, um, so yeah, something as simple as that electrical obviously is really important. So it, I've honestly been shocked at how many of the people that I've interviewed on the podcast, uh, are in a commercial space, just about to move in a commercial space or just moved in a commercial space. Yeah. Like the percentage <laughs> is surprisingly high. Uh, so yeah. it, it's really cool to see how much, uh, you know, the industry has grown. Cause like 
when I like I I moved into my first commercial space in 2015, which kind of dates me. I feel like 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 I'm like the <laughs> last generation of migrants. Oh, gee, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, when, when I did that, there wasn't that many people I knew that were like most people were really small. It was like still blossoming, and now it's really starting to to take off. And there's more and more farms every week moving into commercial space. So I think yep. having a course on um, you know on how to do that whole process from a realtor finding the space you know, uh, like there's so much involved in that, like even just making sure you get a lawyer review your lease, because as a, yep. la as a, as a tenant in commercial space, you really, t you don't have any rights pretty much unless <laughs> no, you're you for yourself to have rights. Um, yeah. and people it's don't realize that, how much like, they you know, have control over what it boils down to it. Oh, like yeah. The things that you have to pay for if something goes wrong, it's really amazing that the things that they can get away with, with that. And obviously any additions yeah. and any improvements you make to the space is theirs to keep if you move out. So, you know, we did a lot to the 2000 square foot space before we moved out because we actually had a store in there as well. So we had a uh, the front half of the building was all local products for sale and the back half of the building was our actual operating farm. So it was a little interesting having two, <laughs> but, you know, we made yeah. it look really nice because of that. And uh, so now they get to reap the benefits of that, having the, a really nice ceiling, really nice floor, you know, all this stuff that we can't take with us. So. It's yeah. a downside, but yeah, I, I would true. say the, things... yeah, the, I was just going to say okay. the 4,000 square foot space was, was much harder to find. Uh, that took mm. us probably at least a year of looking heavily. Mm. Um, and it was really, once you get to that size, it's harder to find a space that has a lower ceiling, has actual HVAC and not just heat. So there's a lot of warehouses in our area that are big, giant open spaces, but the ceilings are 30 feet high and they have a heater that may get it to 50 degrees in the wintertime. And it's like an easy bake oven in the summertime. It's 110, you know, in there all year long. There's no air conditioning. So uh, short of yeah. spending an absolute fortune to have an AC unit completely installed from scratch. Uh, and lowering that ceiling way down. And there was so much work. I mean, because we looked at a 5,000 square foot space originally, and we thought for sure that's where we were going to end up, but it was exactly that setup. And we tried to talk the landlord into helping us out and, you know, turning it into a space that we could use. I mean, we would have stayed in there forever, most likely, um, but it just didn't work out. So we ended up where we are. Yeah. And even then, I mean, we had to put uh, a drop ceiling in, you know, in that space too, but it was a little bit lower. So it wasn't as necessary, but there was insulation kind of attached to the ceiling and I didn't really want that kind of, you know, raining down on everything over time. So we figured we just covered up with the, the ceiling, but yeah, I mean, there's, and we had to put a floor drain in, there was not one there. Well, uh, luckily we knew where yeah. one used to be because <laughs> it used to have two <laughs> bathrooms and you could tell they ripped one of the bathrooms out. So the, you know, the hole where the toilet used to go into was still there. So we just chipped down to that. We were able to tie into that, which was great. Uh, but still, I mean, that was, you know, $10,000 just to have that floor drain yeah. installed plus all the other plumbing. So it adds up fast, oh, yeah. really fast. Oh yeah. 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 No, it's, it's definitely something that, um, it, it's good to properly plan for because costs can definitely get out of hand or you may not understand the reality of doing construction on that kind of scale. Um, yeah. and then especially like it's just gotten more and more expensive. Um, I'm hoping it's going to level out now then, you know, inflation's, uh, you know, not as crazy as it was. So hopefully like though it'll be easier and less expensive to get contractors to do this type of work, but man, like if you try to trying to expand in like 22, 23, me, I, I don't know more recently, but, um, like, it, like one, you're limited on who you can get to use because everyone's so busy. Um, and then two, like it costs a fortune. So, um, yeah. it's really important to have your numbers. And, and that's why I think you make a good point. I, I'm totally on the same page where like stay in your house as long as you can make it as yeah. efficient as possible, save up as much money as you can. And then, uh, plan in the meantime to find a space so that you're not waiting a year or six months or whatever it takes yep. to find a space. Uh, you have it planned, but in the meantime, you're still saving up, you're building that equity to be able to put into the next phase of the business, which would be a commercial space. It would be nice if there's a way to like just infinitely grow in your house. Um, yeah. <laughs> but like it's, you know, at a certain point, it also becomes a pain. Like I remember when I obviously I started my house as well. I was, I had a room upstairs and then I eventually switched to the basement, but even just like taking the trays up and down stairs yep. and, and like disposing a soul in your backyard, like it just, it, it, you're washing trays in, in a, in a shower, you know, just like things that <laughs> just become so inefficient and, um, and, and so time consuming to do. Whereas if you just have like space to have a tray washer, like in my opinion, I, I haven't tried the bootstrap, uh, tray washer, but if I was a farmer and I had commercial space, like I would get a tray washer. 
um, like we had a tray washer, we had to get it custom built because nothing existed. Now something yeah. exists. So like, you know, even if it's not perfect, it'll still be way faster um, than doing it by hand. So having, you know, a dishwasher or tray washer, or whatever, to make that process more efficient, just, uh, you know, as long as the numbers make sense, if you're growing 20 trays a week, maybe not. If you're growing 500, it probably does. Um, so it just depends on kind of the volume you're doing and where you're at. But um, I always encourage people to move towards the direction of uh, not doing as much mundane tasks and focusing on sales and, and building the business and, and letting uh, machinery or, or, or staff do the kind of more uh, mundane tasks. Um, but I'd, I'd love to hear like who, so, so it sounds like you sell to a few different places. Um, do you mo like, who's your main customers? Uh, like, is it direct to consumer still, or is it, has it shifted over the years and, uh, and like what percentage breakdown between those different types of uh, customers do you currently have? Yeah. So we, uh, we started out direct to customer just cause that was the easiest you know path to get yeah. going. Um, and it was probably, I would say at least two to three months before we even started doing any kind of a subscription structure. And it was really just us making sure we could grow everything successfully every single week. Uh, and that way, you know, cause there's no point getting anybody on a subscription if you don't know what you're doing. I mean, you're just going to end up letting yeah. somebody down and when you're brand new <laughs> and just starting, the last thing you want to do is ruin your reputation right off the bat. So, uh, you know, we kind of took the time to make sure we learned everything properly. And then we kind of moved into grocery stores next and it was kind of ironic because it was one of the guys that was coming to our house every week. He used to go to another store that was uh, maybe about 15 minutes from our, uh, where we live. And they sold a different person's microgreens. I'd never even knew there was another person in the area until then. And he's like, yeah, I've been buying, you know, micros from them for years and they're, I can't stand the flavor. I don't really care for them and they don't last very long. And I was like, oh, okay. And he's like, well, yours, you know, are, are definitely much better. And I was like, okay. And he said, yeah, you should go talk to them. And I thought, I never in a million years thought about selling to a grocery store. That's a great idea. I mean, I was so new, you know, and like nobody, there wasn't hardly any information yeah. out there about this kind of stuff at the time. So, um, so he actually helped us get basically an appointment with them. And uh, so I went up there and I talked to the produce manager and, you know, brought some samples and kind of gave them information. And I had no clue what I was doing. It was super nervous because I was like, oh, my gosh, this is like this is the big time. Now I'm, I might be in a grocery <laughs> store, you know, thinking, thinking I'm hot crap here. So, um, you know, after I, I after I left, I called him and I said, you know, do you mind calling and talking to the produce manager? Just kind of reiterate, you know, the uh, the fact that you want our stuff in there and tell them what you like and tell them what you want to see. And all this stuff. So, um, so he did. And then we got our stuff in there and, uh, you know, before we started bringing product there, I called them and I said, well, look, I don't want to compete directly with the guy that's in there. You know, if he's got radish, peas and broccoli, I'll sell something different because we grow at that point, I think we we're already growing like, I don't know, 12 ish varieties or something. And, uh, so they were like, okay, that's cool. No problem. So we ended up basically having his varieties and our varieties, and they were all different, which it just gave people more options. Uh, but unfortunately for him, it didn't work out in the long run. <laughs> our, our stuff was selling more, his stuff was selling less. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, they eventually went out of business, unfortunately, which was not my intention, but um, it is what it is. Uh, and then yeah. I was following them on Facebook and I saw what restaurants they were working with. And so as soon as I found out they went out of business, I mean, the very next thing I did was call all those restaurants and just say, Hey, you know, I heard you just lost your microgreen supplier and kind of filled in from there. So that was kind of how we got started in both grocery stores and restaurants. It's just from that one oh, okay. customer who came to our market, you know, and kind of fed us down that road, which, you know, was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and then I'd say in like January, 2021, we really started hitting restaurants heavier uh, because we realized, okay, I can harvest an eight ounce pack in a millionth of the time it takes me to harvest, you know, two ounce packs. Um, yeah. So we kind of started going down that road a little bit. And then I guess in January of, well, I guess Mar about March of 2022, uh, we went to a show in Ocean City, Maryland, and it's like a hospitality event. And we went there just for the heck of it. And we found all kinds of distributors there. You know, so we started talking to all the local distributors, the smaller scale, not like the Cisco's or any of those guys yet. Yeah. Um, but there was enough of them out there that we could get in touch with and actually potentially become a customer for or provider for anyway. So we reached out to one, we landed them, um, and it started off. I had to buy 12 grow racks to fill their order. I mean, it was insane. And we had six That's grow racks at the time. So we were literally tripling our business in one day. 
Uh, it was about ten to eleven thousand dollars worth of supplies we had to buy. You know, it was nuts. I mean, we had to buy a lot of seed, a lot, all the racks, the lights. You know, we had none of that stuff ready to go. So we ordered it all, got it all in, put it all together. Uh, if I dig back far enough in my, uh, you know, memories on Facebook, there's a picture of all 12 racks after we finished. <laughs> We're standing there like, thank God this is done. <laughs> you know, because they all to be wired and everything else. So, um, yeah. you know, so we started down the road of distributors and, and we found that that was very lucrative, but at the same time, it's very mm -hmm. risky. Uh, and that distributor started out at around a thousand dollars a week. And I think we were three weeks in and they lost one of their biggest customers. And we went from a thousand dollars a week to like $300 a week overnight and one phone call, you know, that's $700 yeah. a week times 52 weeks in a year. That's a lot of money to lose in that's one phone call after we just spent yeah. 10 to $11,000 on racks and stuff. So that was kind of a, a kick in the gut, you know, it made us realize, okay, you know, we need to, we need to not just continually pursue distributors. You need to kind of have everything, uh, kind of balance it out, you know, between the grocery stores, the restaurants, the distributors, we still do direct to customer. I know it's crazy. Um, it's not really worth it for us, but those people help to get us where we are. And mm -hmm. there's so many of them that rely on our products, you know, for their weight loss that they've been going through. I mean, like I said earlier, we have cancer patients that are, that are taking, you know, wheatgrass and broccoli and stuff to help balance out their numbers. And it's of them are terminal. There's nothing they can do. They're, they're going to pass away, but at least they can, live a decent life between now and then, you know, and it's just, yeah. it's hard to pull away from that and to have to tell those people, sorry about your luck, you know, sure. you're not going to be able to get yeah. stuff from us or whatever. So, uh, so yeah, we still do service direct to customer, um, just for that reason. I mean, they, it's like, you can't forget where you came from, I guess it's kind of how I look at it, you know, so we stay there, for too, sure. but yeah, we're, we're definitely very diverse <laughs> and it's, yeah, and it's no, a good that, thing. I mean, it's, it's pandemic yeah, no, safe. That's it's, for sure. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, that, that's that's one thing. Uh, I think like we, we didn't have it that bad during the pandemic. We lost 40 uh, percent of our business overnight from restaurants and the rest was grocery yeah. uh, and, and distributors, that sort of thing. So um, we, we, we were OK, uh, but like losing 40 percent of like a significant amount of money is, is yeah. pretty tough. <laughs> I think we were probably doing about probably about half a million dollars at that point. So like it was it was pretty yeah. tough to, to lose that, that kind of money. But like, um, you know, it, it was a lesson in, especially where I am in, in Toronto, there was like four lockdowns. It, it was, it was nuts here. So like every time the restaurants would close and it, it became like routine by the end where it's like, oh yeah, the restaurants are closing again. Here we go. Um, you know, and, 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 and it was really rough, but, um, uh, I totally know what you mean about like, you know, if the, especially in, in those kinds of situations, it's nice to be the business owner and not have investors or people that are telling you like, that's not profitable. Don't do that because yeah. like you're the business owner, it's your business. You get to choose how to run it. Like no one can tell you that that's right or wrong or like you get to choose what's right for you. And, and it's great to hear that, you know, you're supporting the early customers, um, that, that you have, especially the ones that are, are in need of the product. So, um, yeah. that's, that's really great to hear. And it's, that's one of the things I love about being an entrepreneur is like, it doesn't always have to be like, what is the most profitable? Like you can do whatever yep. you want um, with the end goal of it, obviously making money, having a livelihood, um, trying to ideally work as least as you can to make that money so that you have time for whatever else you want to do with your life. Um, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's just really nice to be able to make those decisions for yourself and yeah. for your, your business or family, if it's a family business. Um, whereas like, so if you work for someone and they, they might tell you, Hey, like we got to cut off these customers. They're not profitable, even if you want to sell them. So that's one of the beautiful things I think about, um, running your own business, being an entrepreneur is you, you can make those choices. Um, and yeah. no one can stop you, which is really nice. And, and even the, the road that we live on, uh, it's a lot, it's about 10 miles long. I would say, uh, we're about four and a half, five miles down from the end. And, uh, you can continue on another four or five miles down, but anybody that lives in a development that's connected to this road gets free delivery for the same reason, even though now we're not even in the same city anymore. Now we're 25 minutes yeah. away. They still get free delivery because they were the ones that drove by every single day on Saturday and stopped in to support us, to get us to where we are. You know, so that's just a yeah. thing. They don't even know. They find out after they actually start an order. And then I say, Hey, by the way, this is a gift to you for being part of that community, you know, where we live. So it's kind of a cool yeah, thing. That's great. But yeah, I mean, it's, and we have so many customers down this road. It's not like we're losing out money, <laughs> you know, by not charging them for delivery. So it works out great. I mean, we're dropping off to a ton of people down here, which is cool. So, but yeah, it's definitely, awesome. I, that's one thing I do like about 
you know, a lot of people have dropped that over the years. You know, they started with home delivery and then they kind of worked away from it yeah. and started doing grocery stores or restaurants or both or whatever. But, you know, it's one thing we've hung on to and uh, it's just, you know, I enjoy it. It's fun. It's fun talking to people and it's, it's great to hear people's stories about how it helps them. You know, and that's, you're not going to yeah. hear that from a customer sitting at a table at a restaurant. They don't give a crap. They're probably scraping your microgreens off because they don't even know what they yeah. are, you know, but the people that yeah. are purposely eating it to eat healthy, that's, that's where the stories really come from. And it's, it's really cool and very rewarding. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Like, like it, it, it de whenever I would get like an email or uh, meet a customer that like, you know, was like raving about the product, it, 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 it helps you move forward. Like it helps you get through yeah. like what can sometimes be difficult times in running a business, wh whether it's like financially or just like emotionally difficult, like just you're overworked and you're tired and, and you just need a vacation, but you can't always <laughs> take a vacation, especially in the yep. early years <laughs> of running a microgreens business. So just ha like hearing that I find really, really helps like the drive and motivation to keep going. Cause it's a reminder, uh, like, you know what, why you're doing it, but like when you're in the day to day, it's really nice to have an external reminder. Um, and it just, it can, like, you could be having a bad day and hear something like, like yep. some positive thing about your product that someone said, and it could please shift your day into like having the best day you've had in a week because it, it, it realigns you with your purpose of why you're running your business. Um, and I think that's really amazing and beautiful and, and such a cool thing to experience. <laughs> um, and yep. I wish that for every microns grower to like have that experience. Uh, I'm sure most too, especially when you're doing direct to consumer, but, um, the more, the more you can, if you can keep that as your business goes, I think it might be worth it just for that alone, um, yeah. to, to, to have that and keep that relationship and remember where you came from and how you started and, and what your, like that your goals are the same or similar to what they were in trying to help people eat healthy and, um, and, and, you know, have a better lifestyle where they have less disease and, and, and pains and suffering and more enjoyment of, of the limited life we have. Yeah. And, and we still promote local home delivery. It's not like we stopped advertising or, you know, we still talk about it and I'm in networking groups. I offer all my networking group people percentages off. So that way they'll hopefully eat the product and actually go, Oh, okay. They'll think about it because they're putting it on their sandwich every day and they'll go talk to a chef and, you know, say something to them about it or whatever. So we offer them yeah. discounts for that reason. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we still promote it to do the, the local home deliveries and we sign people up all the time. So it's definitely just awesome. one of those things, but I, I, I enjoy that piece of it. Like farmer's markets, you'll do farmer's markets. You know, we only go to, we only do one, but you know, cause I'm the only person that usually goes, but uh, it's still fun just to talk to people. And it's just all part of the, the overall education, you know, of getting yeah. microgreens to be known by everyone in the country or everyone in the world. Uh, everybody knows yeah. what sprouts are. And nine times out of 10, when somebody comes over, oh, these are sprouts. Well, technically, no, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, like, it's shifting fast. I can tell is. you for sure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's shifting, uh, you know, fa faster than I would have imagined. Obviously in the cities, it's always a bit ahead. Yeah. I've noticed like, you know, for example, the like customers that we started with in the core city uh, of Toronto, like they knew what my greens were before. And then the further you yep. go out to the suburbs and to the country, less people knew, but now it's starting to, to spread where like, it's pretty rare that I, I tell someone what I do or like what microgreens are and they'll be like, I've never heard of microgreens. Like it's, it's, it's becoming more and more rare. Um, yep. Obviously it depends on who you talk to and the, the, you know, the people you're around obviously, but like generally speaking, I've noticed that less and less people don't know what it is, which is a really good sign that yeah. the work you're doing and the work I'm doing and like what, what all the farms are doing is working and it's building a bigger industry with more demand. And that's something that I think, um, some people don't uh, recognize or, or fully understand that like they think that if there's like multiple people in their town or city that uh, it, it's competition, which it is. But at the same yeah. time, um, it, it builds a bigger market. Like I wouldn't have had the ability to have the success I did if there wasn't farms before me that grew microgreens. Um, it made it my job much easier to sell microgreens. And same thing, like me selling to all these places makes the next generation of microgreens growers easier for them to sell them because there's more awareness around it. So I, I think it's um it's a mindset shift I had throughout the years. It like slowly changed where I was like reframed what competition is and and like how collaboration can be uh, have a bigger net benefit than seeing uh, uh, competition um, with microgreens and and then just like seeing it blossom into the industry. It is obviously if like the industry is shrinking, that mindset may not work because if it's a shrinking industry, there's less product that people will, are willing to buy. But with microgreens, it's like exploded. So yeah. uh, that mindset works pretty well in, uh, well, and it's, in at least I mean, in this industry. 
Yeah, and the ironic part is like uh, probably my biggest competitor. Uh, he's just you know kind of west of Baltimore to a certain extent. We're friends. We talk all the time. I mean, I've literally given That's him awesome. leads. He's given me leads. He actually gave me one of his chefs that he's already working with because he opened up another <laughs> restaurant that's outside of his delivery area that we go by. You know, so it's like it's not a bad thing. Uh, and mm -hmm. the cool thing is because we're so close to each other, if I'm running low on something or he's running low on something, we can touch base yeah. with each other and it's only a 45 minute drive to go pick things up. So, you know, it's, it's awesome to have that. I mean, I've got, uh, at least two other decent size, you know, growers that are in the state of Maryland, but we're all kind of far enough apart to where we're not overlapping a lot. And oftentimes if there's uh, a chef in my general area, he'll reach out to me and say, have you talked to these guys yet? And say, nope, go ahead. Or, yep, I've already talked to them. I'm working on closing them you know, or whatever. So I mean, we're really cool about, you know, keeping that, uh, that good relationship. And, and he even paid me at one point to coach him. I mean, so it's like, why would I want to teach my number one competition, you know, that's out there how to do it better, you know, but it's just yeah. the whole idea. Like you said, I mean, we're, we're all helping create awareness and that's really what it boils down to. Uh, the more people that know about it, the better. I mean, when we started, yeah, it, this is a meat and potatoes country. You know, everybody here hunts. I mean, nothing gets yeah. that. I hunt too, <laughs> you know, but it's like I, you know, nobody had any desire to eat microgreens or know what they were. So we pretty much force fed, you know, this whole industry into this area. <laughs> and I've seen new people pop up all the time, which is great. Um, and they're, they're taking over stuff that I don't want to do anymore. You know, if yeah. there was, there's farmer's markets that we used to do that we don't do anymore. They can jump in there, you know, and, and take over that piece. Or they can talk to a restaurant that I may not want to work with, or it's in downtown Baltimore or something that I don't want to drive down through there. You know, so there's all kinds of opportunity for other people to fill in those voids that you don't want to tackle. And as we get bigger and we start moving more into, you know, the, the distribution side and uh, chain restaurants and things like that and chain grocery stores, there's people that are going to pick up those little mom and pop, you know, restaurants that we used to work with or whatever. So yeah, that's, you know, that's why it's like, there's always going to be people at different levels and there's always going to be ways to fill that market up completely. And I mean, if you had for sure the business of 1% of the population within 30 miles of where you are, you'd be a multimillionaire. You know I mean? It's like yeah. ridiculous. So there's plenty of people out there. There's plenty of business, you know, so don't look as competition as competition. It's, it's really look at it as them helping make everybody aware in your area. And all they're going to do is make your market better as a result. So yeah, yeah it's definitely, it's definitely the right mindset to have. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's cool. I've, I've been seeing more and more of like farms collaborating in the sense of like, if let's say there's a farm that's really good at marketing and they just, they crush marketing, like yeah. they know how to sell microgreens, you know? And then there's a farm that like is really good at production. That's, and then they're fairly close together. Like that's a great potential partnership where yeah. like you utilize both skill sets, um, you know, have someone grow the product and, and not everyone, like some people enjoy the growing side of microgreens. Some people enjoy the, the marketing side and sales side everyone's different. So like you can, you, you can network with other farms in your area and see if there's ways to, to work together, um, to, to make it, you know, something more efficient for you. So you can utilize your skill set better. Um, but at the same time, you still want to develop the skill sets that you're maybe not super strong in because you, you also want to be resilient. I think resilience yeah. is like something that's pretty common with farmers that you don't want to like put a hundred percent of your business into this other farm is going to produce for you. You're going to sell it because if they stop producing, what happens? Like all of a sudden you don't have a business anymore. So um, it's kind of like a balancing act between the two, but I think there's a lot of benefits of working with other farms um, in many different ways. There's so many, like there's so many possibilities that like, I can't, I don't even know <laughs> what they are, but they exist. And it's, and it's up to us to figure out what those uh, opportunities are to work together. Um, and, and it's, it'll like, for example, freeze dry microgreens is something that I've seen more and more pop up. Like that's yep. something that, um, you know, I, I don't know exactly the numbers and business side of it, but it's something that's, that's gaining traction. There's more and more people consuming green powders. Um, and, uh, so, so like, that's a way that's, I would have never thought when I started that that would become, you know, a fairly common thing that people do, um, as microgreens growers. And I see it all the time, at least on social media, it's hard to say like, you know, what the reality is versus social media, but I see lots of farms, uh, you know, um, having freeze dried microgreens in, in different capacity. And, and I think that's really cool. I think it's like innovative yeah. and, and I hope there's more of that type of innovation. Um, 
that continues in history. It's just, it's, it's, it's so cool to just see uh, <laughs> all these new things pop up. The evolution. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so what, what, like, it sounds like you have a pretty diversified market. Like what are the most popular products that you're, you're producing right now? Uh, I would say consumer side broccoli and uh, the spicy salad mix from true leaf. It's one of the, one of the few seeds I still buy from them. No offense to those. I, I just found better seed in other places, uh, but their spicy salad mix is a great mix. Uh, so I would say from the consumer side, definitely those two, the broccoli and the spicy salad, broccoli for obvious reasons, uh, spicy yeah. salad, just cause it tastes amazing. Uh, from the, the chef side, uh, we have a, what we call a rainbow mix. I think it's a pretty common thing to create. Uh, in our case, it's just a mix of rainbow radish, broccoli and amaranth. And so it's a really beautiful mix. And the nice thing is if the customer at the restaurant chooses to eat it, they're getting broccoli in their system at least. <laughs> so, and yeah. not that amaranth is anything to shake a stick at either, but we figured we'd mix in like the healthiest thing. It still looks good. Get the purples, the greens, the, you know, the uh, crimson from the amaranth. So that's our number one by far. And we sell a ton of those rainbow mixes every week, uh, which is good and bad. I mean, the, the bad is mixing it. It's a pain in the butt because all three grow at a different rate, you know, so we have to yeah. grow them separately, which really stinks. And we have to manually mix them, uh, which uh, the guys from Legacy Greens down in Florida, uh, they posted something a while back and they had this picture and it was a small composting thing on their table. And I thought, what in the world is that for? So I reached out to Daniel because uh, he and I have been friends for a couple of years now. And he uh, he's like, yeah, that's what we do our mixes in. I was like, they yes. like it, it mixes up the it mixes up the yeah. greens. Yeah, they yeah. can literally mix like eight pounds of mix at the same time by just you know rotating that thing. Is it's just a regular composting thing you would use in your backyard? Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So and it works fantastic. Very cool. So we have that. And then we have this other really large oh. bin. Again, it's just learning from other people. I mean, I just picked this yeah. bin up like maybe two weeks ago because uh, I saw, um, I can't remember the guy's name from Piedmont Microgreens. Oh, geez. Garrett. Yes. Thank you, Garrett. So he posted a video of, uh, you know, kind of shooting down on his farm as he was harvesting and he was using this huge bin, you know, to mix up his greens. And I thought that's a pretty cool little setup. So I sent him a message and said, Hey man, what, where'd you get that bin? He's like, it's the largest food grade bin I could find. <laughs> so, so I, you know, went on a Webster or a restaurant store, one of the two and ended up grabbing one of those bins. And now that's what we use, you know, and it's, it's yeah. massive. I mean, this thing is humongous. So, uh, it's a little, it's it's a, a lot easier to clean than that compost thing. I can tell you that. So yeah, you know, that imagine, was the biggest yeah. pain every week was having to hose that thing out and, you know, really get in there and get detailed with it. Uh, so it was kind of a nightmare, but this bin is just a massive thing. And it's food grade. It's made specifically for that. So, you know, even when you've been doing this for four and a half years and you're in a 4,000 square foot space, you still learn a ton every day. Oh you yeah. Know? So that's what I try and tell people all the time. Like we don't have all the answers. You don't have all the answers. You know, it's just a matter of like us having the experience and we try and help, you know, help people try and bypass a lot of the crap that we all went through <laughs> to learn things the yeah. hard way, you know, and that's really our 100%. goal uh, with all that. So yeah, be, be open to learning as yeah. much as you can without a doubt. Yeah. That's a great point. I, I think like, you know, I, I think some new yours might think that people like us might just like have all the answers. And I think that's a great point that like, even yeah. in the last year after running living earth for 10 years, we were still making changes and improvements to workflow yep to uh, how we run operations, how we manage staff. So like, it's an ever evolving thing. It's like, and I think it's a really good mindset to have is like, there's no like finished, you know, it's, it's yeah. just a constant evolution <laughs> of, you know, you gain more knowledge as you get more experience and then you implement that knowledge into the business. So there is no like end point. Um, and, I, yeah. and I think it's, it's really important uh, for people to recognize that because you, 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 you can honestly, you can often chase this like end goal of like, okay, I'm going to, have X amount of money, or I'm going to have this large farm or what, whatever it is that, that that's attracting you to, to move forward. Um, and like, think that you're going to get some satisfaction, uh, and, and everything's going to be perfect when you get there, but it, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not the reality of life. Yeah. Like, there's always <laughs> new problems, new things to solve. Um, but the cool thing is those problems are opportunities to learn how to do things better. So as long as you're constantly learning, constantly improving, that's what matters. Not that like you end up in some point where, it's like, you know, this end all be all microgreens farm or whatever it is, because it doesn't it doesn't exist. There's always problems. There's always challenges. There's always opportunities um, and there's always opportunities for, for growth in, in, in how you look at problems, as an example. So I think that's yeah. a really good point that you bring up that, like, we don't have all the answers. We just yeah, no, learned I mean, what we've learned and can share that. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. 
Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're working with a grower that's telling you it's their way or the highway, and that there's no other way to do something, then walk away from them. Uh, I mean, there's there's plenty of growers out there that are very open to the idea of learning new things, uh, and I've learned tons of stuff from brand new people, you know, that are just getting started. I'm like, I never thought to do something like that, you know. So, yeah, if it's if it's my way or the highway, then then move on. You're much better off because you're going to learn a lot more from from somebody else. Yeah. It's also like, like as someone that, that is in the education space, you want to be open-minded in my opinion. Like you want to be open to new ideas. Like if there's, I always tell people, if there's like a better, uh, uh, soil recipe, which we can definitely talk because I know you, you, we have like differing opinions, which I'm, I think is a good thing. You know, um, I actually haven't tried Coca Loco, but like, if there's a better soil recipe that will give better results, like I'm, I, I want, I want to encourage people to use that, you know, cause like yeah. whatever is going to give you the best results with the highest nutrition and quality, like that's good. And I don't really care about like if I'm right or wrong or whatever, like I rather just have people have the best quality possible microgreens as an example. Um, yeah. that's, that's more important. And like my ego can, you know, what do whatever it wants to do, but like, it does, that doesn't really <laughs> matter. Like I'd rather move the industry forward than like yeah. be right. Um, and if it seems like you have a similar mindset, which is great, because I think that's so important oh, yeah. in educating people is like not being uh, closed minded or being having one way of doing things. And this is the only way it's going to work. There's hundreds of ways it can work. And the more we think like that, the more innovation will actually happen. Um, and uh, and there might be some ways that are better in certain ways and other methods that are better in other ways. And it's like what works best for you, I think, is an important yeah. question for people to ask, like what methodology works best for you not because like it could work really well for one person and the other person's like no that that's too uh too rigid or you know or or, or not rigid enough you know wh whatever it may be just as one example um so i think it's it, it's great that you have that same uh mindset on um you know especially being an educator in the space to be open to new ideas uh, doesn't yep. matter who it's from. Like you said, if it's someone new and they have a great idea, it's a great idea. It doesn't matter if they're yep. new or experienced or whatever. If it's a good idea, it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I was fairly new to doing all of this and, uh, we discovered, a, a, we tried a different way of growing arugula, you know, which a lot of people struggle with, uh, especially as a new grower. And yeah. so we tried a couple different methods and we found this one method that worked and, uh, you know, started posting about it and saying, Hey, we tried this out. It's working really well. And next thing you know, you know, Robert Meredith's growing his arugula that way. And Mike Hicks is growing his arugula that way. And, you know, it was like, it was cool to see like us as a fairly new person, you know, helping these at the time, much bigger growers than us, you know, actually being able to, you know, advance their own internal stuff that they were doing. So, oh, yeah. yeah, you have to, I mean, if you're, if you're stuck in your mindset and you're just sitting up on this throne at the top of the hill, looking down upon all your peons that are, they are the growers that you're working with and, and saying, this is how it's got to be done. These are the rules. These are the rules. I mean, it's, you're wasting your time. You're not helping anybody at that point for uh, sure because everybody's environment's different. Everybody's experience is different. Everybody's equipment is different. Uh, it's just, it's impossible for me to be able to say, this is how it has to be done across the board. You're seeding broccoli. It's got to be exactly this number of grams. You got to give it exactly this much water every single day and use this exact soil. And if you use anything other than that, it's going to be a waste of your time. And it's just, it's stupid. Yeah. So I mean, if it was that simple. Yeah, for real. If it, <laughs> it, if it was that simple, nice we could just manufacture microgreens out of like, you know, <laughs> we, like if it, if it was that, if, if it was that easy, there would be, uh, yeah, it would, it would be a different industry, but there's a lot of nuance. There's as much yeah. science as there is art. There's definitely like, especially with watering um, is, is one that, you know, it's so dependent on the soil that, yeah, you can break yeah. down the science, but it really comes down to like, if you're watering by hand, figuring out with your specific soil they are using, how do your plants absorb the water through the, that soil? How long does it hold on to that water? And, yep. and, you know, that'll give you a better direction, how much and how often to water than like, me saying water every two days and water 500 milliliters or whatever, because it's, it's, yeah. if you're, if you're in Arizona, it's gonna be very different than if you're in Florida and like, you know, high humidity, low humidity environments, you know, um, yep. and temperature too. 
Yeah. And and that's what a lot of people struggle with when they try, uh, you know, a, a lot of people push pro mix, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, we tried it a couple of times and it's, it's super dry in comparison to Coco Loco. So oh, yeah. a lot of people that started with pro mix are used to having to water it a lot more, you know, than what the Coco Loco actually calls for. So they switch, they water it the same amount. And then they're complaining to me like, Oh, this is, this is a disaster. I've got yeah, mold yeah. and all kinds of, you know, dampening off. I'm like, Whoa, hang on. <laughs> it's like, it's not the soil. It's not that simple. <laughs> yeah. You need to yeah. make that modification. And that's, that's just stuff you learn over time. You yeah. Know, it's going to help you make those minor adjustments when you really Realize, okay this is what the plants actually like and that's why literally i have six employees two of us water and that's it and that's it i mean because yeah. it's it's one of those things we still hand water and it's one of those things that you have to know you know you when you pick up the tray depending on what variety it is you can say yep this doesn't need as much this needs more you know it's that little tiny tiny detailed stuff you know that you pick up on over time and that's why it's literally me and one other person that do the watering because they've been yeah. super well trained and have done it for years um and you know the one time i went on vacation last year uh you know my daughter's one of my full-time employees she's the other person that can water and both of us went on a family trip together for obvious reasons and uh, we lost uh, about 80 trays of microgreens oh, wow. in that week while we were gone because they were wow. overwatered, you know, and they all dampened off. And it was just, you know, somebody who I thought I had trained well enough, uh, even though they had worked there at the time for like a year and a half and had watered enough times. But if you're only doing it like once or twice a week versus the entire week, <laughs> you can't do nearly as much damage in that short period yeah. of time. So we lost a lot of trays that one specific week. But uh, the nice thing is because we have, a really good game plan in place with backup plans and backup plans. We didn't miss a single order, you know, even with oh, losing amazing. 80 trays that week, we still filled every single order. The clients had no clue, you know, that we had that happen. So, but throwing away, you know, all those trays, that yeah, sucked a lot. It's hard. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> a lot no, of money sure. going down the toilet. <laughs> I wonder if like, um, because I, I've done some tests with, uh, it wasn't Coco Loco. It was just uh, coconut coir on its own. Um, yeah. And I know Coco Loco is a better quality quar because they get rid of a lot of the, the salts in there. So it's a better starting base. Plus there's all nutrients and stuff added in. Yep. Um, but I, I, I just, when you said that, I was thinking like, I wonder if, if uh, Promix is easier for beginners, but as you advance and get more comfortable with watering, I like, it'd be interesting to see the difference at some point I'm traveling pretty soon, but when I come back, I'll, maybe I'll do a test side by side. And even still, even my tests are not going to be perfect because like, th like, it, it's it, unless you know exactly how much water is going to be optimal for the different yep. soils, it's pretty hard to give it the exact amount. Um, so, so, uh, but, but having said that, like, I think that would be an interesting experiment. Not, not, it's, it's not like I want to, uh, have one be right or wrong, but just to see yeah. if there is like how the differences are, because sometimes it's not like what you think it is, you know, like, for example, I grew with coconut coir, um, in, in one of the last, uh, videos I did, um, versus Promix. And the coloring was very different. So the the coconut coir was more purple uh, th th than the promix. So there's different there's different benefits with different soils. It's not just like this one's better, this one's worse. It's like yeah. again to your situation and what you're looking to to do with the soil. Um, so yeah, I think that would, that would be interesting. But I think co coconut coir is a little trickier with the watering for sure um, yeah. because it's, it's yeah. a lot easier to overwater because it just it holds a lot more which is great if you figure out how to water it because then you don't need to water as often. <laughs> but uh, it can, it, it, it's a lot easier to overwater than like a pro mix from my experience. Well, and, and honestly, switching from straight Coco Coir to Coco Loco is not that challenging. They're almost watered the same, you know, because they both have really good water retention capabilities. Yeah. Uh, whereas somebody switching from Promix, which is a much drier soil overall, that's where we yeah. always saw the struggle. Uh, and, and even if you went from Promix to straight Coco Coir, you would see the same issue. Yeah, struggle. You know, yeah, because the Coco Coir is going to hold water so much more. So it's just, it's one of those things. We have, and we tried um, MP Organic, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, and uh, we ran it for about three or four months. And, you know, we have farm flow, which keeps track of all your data. So we were able to see what our yields look like. And across the board, we were losing 20% wow. of yield on every single tray, which, you know, the scale, you know, it's like you're planting 20% more of a massive scale already. Yeah, so it was just yeah. a total nightmare to have to plant all these extra trays. And even though you're saving money on the soil, <laughs> you know, as oh, far yeah. as what it costs per square foot or whatever, you're using way more soil. <laughs> so you actually yeah. end up losing money on the soil that you think you're saving money on. So we ended up switching back. And, uh, but even now, I mean, um, 
Uh, Mike Hicks found uh, Coast of Maine's Sprout Island apparently is even better yield wise than Coco Loco. So that's the one I want to look into at some point too. So again, mine's not yeah. the end all be all, you know, yeah. just what we found out of all the ones we tried, you know, that worked the best for us. And uh, it's, we've seen it happen in a lot of other people's cases too, but you know, they, they found this one. So at some point I'm going to try that one out too. And that may be what we go to next. You never yeah. know. So yeah, that's why you got to be open-minded and keep an eye on what everybody's doing. And especially the big guys, you know, keep an eye on what they're doing for sure, because yeah. chances are if they're making a change, it's worth it because for us to change soil is a huge deal. You know, if you're yeah. in your oh, house yeah. and you've got one rack for you to change soil, it's not that big of a deal. You really have, you know, maybe 20, 30 trays. But, you know, when you're talking hundreds and hundreds of trays, it's that's a pretty serious thing to take on risk wise. You could lose your whole entire crop or have everything come up 50 percent as much as it weighed before. That's going to jack you up big time. Yeah. You're gonna miss yeah. orders for weeks and weeks, potentially. So, you know, it's a it's a much bigger risk for sure. Yeah, that that's why whenever like, for example, when I, when I do con, uh, like any consulting, whatever I recommend, I'm always like, don't switch your production that you're selling. Yeah. Do <laughs> side experiments and, and yep. do them for a, like, don't do them for like once and be like, okay, I got 30% higher yields. Like you got to keep doing it and see what the potential issues are with different methodologies. And then once you see it's stable, you're like, okay, I switched to like, let's say Coco Loco from, from ProMix. And like every week consistently, I'm getting a bet, whatever it is, better yield, better quality, whatever your metric that is most important to you or multiple metrics keep track of, um, yeah. then make then make the switch. And then even still, I'd probably make the switch slowly um, rather than like switching all production at once. Because uh, I switched watering because we, we had uh, like automated watering at our farm. So like we it's so easy to switch a schedule. You just like change uh, the, the, <laughs> the actual like schedule on a computer and then it just does yeah. it all for you. So you don't even need to think about it. I remember I, I, I reduced the watering because I'm like, okay, it's getting too much water. And I reduced it by like, I don't know, a quarter or something of the amount of water it gets. And <laughs> it was, it was just like, I came in on harvesting and I was like, Oh my God, what did I just do? This is like, <laughs> this was a very bad idea. I, and that was the last time I learned the lesson. I said to myself, like never again, I, it's it, the farm's too big to start doing these kind of risks on the whole yep. farm. You have to do it incrementally. Some things are easier. Soil is much easier to inc incrementally change than the temperature you grow at or the humidity yeah. level, right? Because like, it's it's practically impossible unless you're gonna make like a growth chamber to switch the temperature or humidity on only a section of, of, of your production or like a test area, unless you have yeah. section, your farm is sectioned off. So those type of things are definitely a lot harder to change, but like watering, soil, like even testing out new seeds, like, you know, uh, top coating, whatever it is you do um, that you wanna experiment with, like amount of hours of light you do, it's always best to do it on the side, find yeah. out what the results are, repeat those results, like take a very scientific approach with that. Once you see that, then start switching out your production. And even still, I would do it slowly. Um, and, and, and that way, the risk of like things going really bad, get really low, which is the most yeah. important thing is like when you're at that scale is like, there's too much money on the line. There's too many customers expecting the product to, to make those like really risky decisions. Um, on the fly to change yeah. all of production. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing I always tell people is one time does not make a trend. <laughs> yeah. You know, just yeah. because you had this wild success or wild failure, you know, on making a change or trying a new experiment and it either works or doesn't work better or worse than it did before. It doesn't mean it's always going to be the case, you know, give it a couple tries, give it a several months if you have to just experimentation. Yeah. I mean, when For we, sure started switching away from uh doing blackout for a lot of things you know we learned from on the grow you know because we didn't know what the heck we were doing yeah. so they were the closest thing we could find to what we thought was expert advice and you know don't get me wrong they, they've helped a, a lot of people get started but they also they teach a few things that don't make any sense now yeah. um and yeah. we realized that blackout was one of those things and we were washing hundreds of blackout trays every single week and we thought let's try it without it you know yeah. so every week whatever we were growing we would purposely take one tray out of that entire set you know and not have it be in blackout we'd label it and we'd keep track of it the whole entire time and then we made sure specifically to weigh that one tray out compared to the rest you know harvest weight wise and everything and we found that almost every single one was either the same or more harvest yeah. weight without running blackout you know so it's just little things like that that you think you're you're like oh i, I have to put it in blackout so it gets taller you don't have to. No. <laughs> it does it in the light. They'll get, they'll get taller <laughs> on the road. Yeah, 
hundred yeah, percent. That's yeah. it. So it's just a total waste of time having to, you know, get all these extra trays, which you, number one, you have to purchase. And now you're either paying somebody to wash them or you're spending the time washing them oh, yeah. versus not having to do that at all. So, I mean, that cut back our washing time by like a third wow. you know, every single wow. week, which is fantastic. So, yeah. you know, little yeah, things that, like that. that, that again, that just reiterates the, the, like, I think the, the theme of this episode is like the, <laughs> how important having an open mind um, yeah. is in running this type of business or really any business, but obviously we're both, both, uh, micro greens growers. So like you have that open mind, you can, you can critically think and be like, okay, this is what I learned, but just cause you learned it doesn't mean it's going to be the best way to do something in your situation. So if you like always have the mindset of experimenting, trying new things, you'll, it'll, you'll get much faster to the point of, um, you know, making the decisions that make the most sense for you in the business rather than yeah. like just like, you know, th th that's why YouTube's great because there's so much information, but at the same time, <laughs> it's information overload. And like, yeah. you have no idea what is is good advice or bad advice when you're starting out because like, you just go based on logic. Yeah, they need blackout because like, they need to stretch. It's, it's yeah. logical, but like, you know, how, how would you know unless there's, you know, you try out something like that, unless there's other people like me and you who I think we're on the same boat with the blackout is for the most part, not, not needed. Um, yeah. That, that like, how would you know that, you know, like, so, so just yeah. experiment, um, is the, is honestly the best way to figure out what works in your situation. Obviously learn from people like, like us, uh, because like, you know, we, we've done it, but don't take what we do as like, uh, fact a hundred percent of yeah. the time, That's gospel. try it out. <laughs> always, always try out what we recommend sort of thing rather than like, okay, this is the way I have to grow because you'll be much better off for that. And, and you also help the yeah. industry grow because you'll learn more that way as well. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, it's, it's, that's the thing. It's like, you have to, and I think that's the one challenge with a lot of new growers is that they, they join microgreen groups and they ask a question and they're getting replies from other beginners, you know, and that really yeah. isn't helping matters because those oh, beginners yeah. don't know what they're doing. And they've, they've learned either a good or a bad technique from somebody and because somebody told them this is how it's supposed to be done. They take that as absolute gospel. It's got to be yeah. this exact number of seed and this exact that and this exact this, you know, and I think that's where things get a little convoluted. And that's why, like, yeah, I mean, you're always going to want to look to the bigger growers, you know, whether they're coaching people or not, you know, at least kind of keep yeah. an eye on what they're doing. They, a lot of them post a lot of great videos uh, just showing how they do things at their farm, for example. Yeah. So, you know, pay attention to that stuff because ultimately those are the guys that are doing this either full time you know, or very close to full time and have a business that's, you know, six figures or higher. And they take, a, you know, there's a lot of risk involved for them to make those changes like we talked about, but, you know, chances are they're probably doing things the right way, you know, and yeah. most of us, we're regular people. I need, you know, I want you guys to all understand that because <laughs> that's, every time I have somebody come to my farm, we have people, we have people that have driven six hours, you know, just to wow. come meet me in person. And I'm like, this is so insane. You're driving all this distance. I'm just a normal human being. You know, that's just, I have a bigger farm than a lot of people. That's it. I mean, there's yeah. nothing, there's nothing fancy about you. There's nothing fancy about me. Yeah. We're regular human beings. And, you know, if we get up in the morning, do the exact same thing as everybody else. We're not sitting in our multi bazillion dollar mansions or anything doing this yeah. stuff. So, you know, we're yeah. just regular people. So approach us as that, you know, I mean, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you know, I encourage people all the time to you know, message me on Facebook and, you know, I get back to everybody, literally. Uh, it may not be right then and there, depending on what I'm in the middle of at the time, but you will get a reply, even if it's the next day, you know. So if you have any questions you need to ask, that's an easy way to start. And, you know, For sure. and uh, we run Urban Ag Academy, you know, which is me, Josh Shaver and Robert Meredith. Uh, it's on the school platform, S-K-O-O-L. So if you look up Urban Ag Academy in there, that's a great group that we just, you know, it's direct mentorship, basically, with the three of us working with a group of people that are in there. So awesome. uh, we look into that. And, you know, I've got a couple of Facebook groups, Microgreens Entrepreneurs. Uh, and then I have one called Microgreens for Beginners, Learn and Grow with Experts. And because they had a microgreens for beginners originally and it had like 60,000, you know, members or something insane, but it was beginners leading beginners. So it wasn't really helping. So yeah. uh, when I created that group, I invited a lot of, you know, really good quality growers that I trust and, you know, brought them into the groups. So that way all of us as a collective can help, you know, new growers instead of them leading, you know, 
it's the blind leading the blind for the most part. Yeah. So at least yeah, oh, you know, yeah. they can get some guidance. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's sure. going to help them grow. And, uh, you know, and then as your business takes off, you can get into that microgreens entrepreneurs group and, you know, learn about how to actually grow the business. And then urban ag Academy takes you to that next level even. So, uh, there's all kinds of cool options out there, you know, as far as that goes. And then Robert Meredith has a group on Facebook as well. I don't know that exact name off the top of my head, but it's like commercial microgreen growers, something, something, something. Yeah. Uh, but you want to look for the one that's ran by him because there's another one that has a similar name that's not ran by him uh, but all those groups are very very supportive and uh you know we boot everybody out who's mean we boot everybody out who posts even one little tiny thing you're you're banned i mean <laughs> the band hammer comes out immediately so i don't even deal with that <laughs> yeah so i try and keep sure. the group on topic and you know and straightforward so yeah that's yeah the whole that's point. great but yeah, um, it's a great all resource that, all around yeah yeah for sure on that topic when you mentioned like answering every message and, 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 uh, and like, you know, you have your, your, uh, uh, farm software, you're running your farm, you're doing education work. <laughs> like how, how do you manage all, all that? You know, like, like, you know, I've been in a similar situation and running three businesses and it, it's a lot, like there's, there's no question yeah. about it. It, it. It's a big commitment. It's a lot. I'm just curious on how you manage all, all of that with the farm and, and education work and, uh, the software, like, what, what, what is, what is your week look like and how do you manage all the work that needs to be done in, uh, yeah, I mean, in the so short week I'm, you have? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have a very, very good team. Uh, you know, we have, um, my daughter works there full time. She's been with us since, uh, 2022, I guess at this point. Um, and then since then we've hired, you know, brought in, I don't know, probably about 12 or 13 different people, a couple have come and gone, but I mean, most of my employees have been there for more than two years and, considering they're getting paid minimum wage or barely above minimum wage, you know, we must be doing something right to be able to retain all these people uh, for as long as we do. So it's, it's a very relaxed environment. It's very leadership driven, you know, to where like, I mean, I have an employee that's one of my almost full timers that I'm pushing to go to college. I'm pushing them to go get a career outside of doing what they're doing now. I don't want them to be stuck, you know, working for me for the rest of their life. I want them to go pursue their dreams, you know? So it's, it's a really cool, just kind of chilled out environment, but that's what allows me to have the minimal time that I do get <laughs> to be able to work on other things outside. So uh, like Sunday, I usually have off, believe it or not. Uh, but it's not like you're ever really off. I mean, you're always yeah, doing yeah. something for the most part, but um, so I'm usually home, you know, that's my, uh, my day with my wife. We go to church and do what we have to do throughout the day. And then I do a podcast uh, on urban ag Academy every week. We do a live Q and a uh, Sundays at 7 PM. It's the three of us usually. Uh, so answering questions and sometimes we'll come in with a topic. Sometimes we won't, sometimes we'll bring a member on, on, you know, to actually like just have a, um, a brand new farm or a newer farmer, you know, kind of yeah. perspective as well, which works out really good. So the, that, the community loves everything about it. I mean, it's a really tight knit thing. Uh, but anyway, so on Sunday, usually at the farm, we're actually planting, uh, we plant our 10 day crops to harvest that following Wednesday. Um, so that would be our commercial crops basically. Um, so for Sunday, that's pretty much it. I mean, it's a big planting day for us. Uh, and then Monday, you know, I, it's funny if you can see my calendar, like my Google calendar, I use that combined with an app called Todoist. Uh, it's just literally to do and then IST. And I put all my tasks in there, you know, and I've got them all divided out to like, what am I, what do I have to get done this week? What do I have to get done next week? You know, this month, next month, uh, what are my long-term things I want to get done? So anytime something pops into my head, like, oh, I got to get back to that customer or whatever, I throw it in there, you know, and then that way it's like documented that has to be finished, <laughs> you know, yeah. and that's the only way I can keep my sanity. And then uh, <laughs> in, in Google Calendar, I've got a lot of just time blocks, if you will, kind of set up to say, okay, for, you know, 15 minutes, you're going to reply to emails and that's it. That's all I give myself. I don't want to be sitting there, you know, checking email for two hours or whatever, because you can get sucked into that so easy. So in that 15 minutes, I'll look back, you know, what did I get in the last three or four days or whatever, make sure everybody got replied to and deal with that. And then I move on and then I give myself like 15 to 20 minutes to research new clients, you know, because I also don't want to be diving into that because that's something you can go down that rabbit hole and be yeah. there forever. Um, I mean, there's so many clients, it's like, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, and then usually I'll spend some of that time, um, you know, setting up uh, follow up with customers, you know, so it'll be, doesn't have to necessarily be replying to an email. It could be following up with a customer via text, via email or whatever. So I have time set aside for that. I know it sounds crazy, but it's like, it, it forces me no matter what I'm doing to stop and do that for a short period of time yeah. to make sure it gets done every week. 
because weeks can easily go by where you're not oh, yeah. replying to anybody. You're not following up with anybody. Next thing you know, it's three months later and you're reaching out to a chef that you talked to three months ago. And he's, oh my gosh, chef, I'm so sorry. I am following up and they probably forgot who you are at this point. You know, so it's like really important to have that kind of set in stone. Uh, so Monday, usually I'm doing stuff like that. And then I also set aside two hours on Monday to work on farm flow, you know, because there's always little things that I'm thinking about that I want to do. And they go into that to doist app, you know, so I have like a, uh, thing that's labeled as farm flow upgrades that I feel like I need to do. Uh, so I'll put those in there, things I need to get done this week, next week, you know, what's more important, what's less important. And um, so that's really like kind of my Monday to a certain extent. So I'm usually typically home on Mondays as well, even though it's a day I just, you know, it's in office, if you want to call it that. Um, Cause it's, it's very light. Like on Monday, literally all we do is water. We don't move anything. We don't plant anything. We don't harvest anything. Uh, and we literally aren't even taking anything out of weight on that day. It just happens to work out perfect. So my daughter usually goes in, she's there for like an hour at the most, you know, just waters. And then she puts a couple things in buckets for automated soaking and then she goes home. So that's an easy, easy day. Um, and then Tuesday I usually set aside for like networking events, uh, you know, going to meetings, things like that. Cause chefs typically don't work on Monday. So I usually try and set it up on a Tuesday when it's going to be really slow. Um, mm -hmm. oftentimes you can even go in on during their lunch hour and there's nobody there, you know, for the most part, especially around here. Um, so again, I'll just, you know, be replying to emails, researching new clients, things like that. And Tuesday is a planting day. It's a lighter planting day. We're planting our 10 day crops for that following Friday, which is all of our residential yeah. clients. Um, so it's never really not too, too bad. And then Wednesday is, uh, that's harvest day. That's major harvest day. That's when we're harvesting all of our grocery stores, all of our distributors, all of our restaurants, all of our commercial clients across the board. Um, so that is a, about a 9 a.m. to 4 or 5 p.m. day, uh, depending on the people we have there. I mean, we've been there as late as 8 or 9 o'clock at night a few times. Yeah. Uh, if one person calls out, it sucks. <laughs> so oh, yeah. Yeah. there's usually four of us there all day harvesting, and that's all we're doing. Most of the time, none of us even eat lunch. We don't even stop. We just want to get it done to you know be able to leave earlier. Um, so that's literally all day. So Wednesday, I'm always at the shop. Uh, and then Thursday is our heavier planting day. So it's our two week crops that are going to be harvested, I guess, you know, 13 days from then on that Wednesday. Um, so we plant a lot that day. It's a big, big heart planting day. Uh, and if I'm not there planting and my delivery driver is out for whatever reason, then I'm running deliveries, which is about an eight or nine hour trip. Uh, we're driving literally all over the state of Maryland, practically, uh, mostly through Delaware. Uh, we hit a lot of places that day <laughs> and uh, literally probably this week, I'm going to have to start researching at least a bigger delivery van or a second mm -hmm. delivery van because we're starting to max out the one that we have, uh, unfortunately, which holds about nine coolers, but unfortunately good problem know, to have. we're at that point yeah it's a phenomenal yeah. problem to have <laughs> but at the same time it took us like a year to find the van we have oh, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah yeah so it's not something i'm going to be easily be able to just locate tomorrow um yeah. so we'll see how it goes but i mean you know we could always like and again this is where you have to think on your feet as a business owner especially when you get to this size we could potentially move our grocery stores to Saturday delivery when we do residential, you know, because they don't care if they get it on Saturdays where all the restaurants, we want them to have it on Thursday. So that yeah. way it's fresh for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, for you sure. know, on their busiest days. So, um, yeah. So then, uh, Friday is just harvesting day for residential. It's a pretty light day. Um, and we're harvesting for the farmer's market the next day, stuff like that. And then Saturday, I usually do the farmer's market myself. And then uh, my delivery driver would be running deliveries or me if she's out. And then we spend that day washing trays as well. So I have two very, very fast tray washers. <laughs> it is insane how fast they can get trays done. I mean, in four hours, they're filling four or five racks from top to bottom with trays. It's unreal how quick they get it done. And everything is hand washed. Everything is hand oh, wow. scrubbed. Everything is is soaked. You know, I mean, it's like we just have a system in place to where everything moves through the line very efficiently. So wow. when you're, you're waiting for one thing to happen, you can be doing something else and then vice versa. Uh, so it works out extremely well. And um, yeah, and then we plant a little bit on Saturday. It's not too bad. It's kind of our two week crops for uh, that following Friday. Uh, for harvesting for the residential people. So it's a lighter planting day, but it's really more farmer's market. We spend a lot of time cleaning on Saturdays as well, just kind of cleaning up the shop, sweeping everything up. Cause it's kind of like the last major thing we have to worry about uh, until next Wednesday. Yeah. So yeah, it's a good time just to get the place under control, but yeah, it's yeah. pretty much how the week looks. But <laughs> I mean, yeah. up until, you know, my one employee started going back to college, I was literally in the shop on Wednesdays and that was it. 
I had every other day to be home making calls, setting up meetings, doing whatever I needed to do. Um, so it was really nice for that period of time. But now I'm actually making up for their you know hours, but they're in school. Uh, yeah. So they can only work. Thank God they can work on Wednesdays. It was the only day they have off <laughs> Monday through Fridays. So I was like, thank God for that because I want to suck to find somebody else. Um, yeah, but they're sure. they're available on the weekends on Wednesdays. So I'm I'm working their I was working their Tuesday shift with my daughter, but it's light enough to where she can do it by herself and get extra hours. And you know, I'd rather be here setting up meetings and doing stuff like that. So for sure, good. But yeah. That's pretty yeah, much what our week looks like. I wish that was it, but there's way more things than that, as you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's al- yeah. there's always there's always a fire to put out in some capacity, especially the larger yeah. you get. Like that's at least from my perspective, that's what it seems to be. Like, I, like I don't think there's any like CEO, just like the owner type of role is like you put out the fires. That that that's at the end of the day, that's what you do, and then you yeah. build the business, um, and, yep. and then and then fill in for people, all that kind of stuff. But what what I found is the last. Uh, I'd say the last two years, but especially the last year, it was it was like in running uh, uh, my farm it was really about like how do we optimize uh, so that when someone does call in sick, that things run as smoothly as possible, so that there's the least amount yeah. of disruption. Because it's hard when you have like five or six staff, or you, let's say you have two staff. If one person yeah. calls in sick, you have fifty yep. <laughs> percent less staff. Like people may not yep. realize that that is a big part of the challenge of. Uh, going from being like you as the owner, which you're hundred percent reliable to yourself. Most people are um, to when you have staff and, you know, life happens like, you know, like that's just yeah. part, part of having employees. Um, so, so like that was where most of my energy and time went in the latter years of, uh, of running the farm, uh, like production, all that kind of stuff, customers that, that all that kind of stuff's figured out. Uh, but it was, it was really about how do we get the farm to run as efficiently as possible with me having to be there the least amount of possible time. Um, and then obviously if someone quits, like you're the person that is probably going to be the backup until you, you find someone else yeah. or if someone goes back to school or whatever it may be. So um, that's just the reality of, of, uh, of a small business. And I don't even think it's just yep. migraines. I think any business, uh, when you have a small amount of employees, um, it's great to have employees because they make your life a lot easier. But when they do uh, have something like getting sick or, 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 or quit or, or uh, go back to school, it can be because uh, you have all the work you have to do and then you have this, which like has to be done. That's always the priority because production, like you, you can't stop it. Whereas like getting a new customer might have to go on the back burner, which is not ideal, but yeah, you got, you got to yep. keep, you got to keep the, uh, the engine roaring. Yeah. And we've been in those positions before where, you know, months would go by where I'm like, I can't bring anybody else on right now, you know, as far as from a customer standpoint, because yeah. oh, I had yeah. to get enough people trained up and in, in, in that position to be able to actually handle the job. But the one benefit I think we have uh, is everybody that's ever worked for me has all left on great terms. You know, they just found another job that had more hours or whatever, which is totally fine. Um, so the beauty of it is when, if I have enough notice, I can call any of those guys yeah. and say, Hey, you want to just come in and get paid by the hour, you know, under the table and, and come in and do work for a day. And they're like, heck yeah. And they get paid well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On those <yeah>. days, <laughs> I make sure they're well taken care of because if they're coming in to help me out in a bind, then, you know, I'm definitely going to give them above and beyond what they would normally get, yeah. uh, which is cool. So, and that's the one nice thing too, is that we have that, that resource out there where I can reach out to some people and say, Hey, you know, I'm missing a couple of people this day. Do you want to come in and help out? And usually they will, you know, yeah. which is cool. So, you know, that's one beautiful thing about like having you know employees that trust you they enjoyed working for you i mean all all the people that come work for me and it's their first job i I literally tell them after a month or two i'm like i'm gonna ruin every job from you for the rest of your life because (laughs) you're never gonna work in an environment that's as laid back and easy you know and it's not like we don't work hard but you know i i literally tell everybody right off the bat i'm like take as much vacation as you want you know, there's, there's no limitation. You can take off whenever you need to, as long as you give me enough notice, you know, because you're not getting paid enough to where I should have to dictate that, you know, in your life. Um, yeah. So, and most of them honestly don't take advantage of that. I mean, it's my delivery driver, her husband has a crazy job. So he gets off a week every once in a while and they go on vacation a lot, you know, which they should, because this guy's working his butt off. Um, so, but we work around it. And every time she puts in vacation time, she's like, I feel so bad. I'm like, no, I told you to do this, <laughs> you know, because she's super reliable. She's incredibly nice yeah. and she's very well-trained and uh, you know, it's, it's worth it for me to have those, that level of quality people in exchange for, the freedom that I try and give them because, you know, I mean, if you've ever worked in the corporate world, which sounds like you have, it's, 
you know, you you're under the thumb of your boss yeah. all day long or the business as a whole. And, uh, you know, you don't have any freedom. Ultimately, they dictate exactly how you're going to do things when you're going to do things. So, you know, we try and keep it open. And I tell them all the time, you know, if you can come up with a better way for us to do something, um, you know, tell me, I mean, it's, I'm totally open to it. Yeah. Uh, and especially when they're first starting to learn how to do complicated jobs, like harvesting, like even planting, you know, spreading the seeds by hand, uh, you know, what, I always encourage them try it different ways, you know, try it like this for like two or three days and then change it up, you know, and see if this works better for you, if it works worse for you, if you're faster at it, if you're slower at it, you know, and that's how you kind of develop that over time. And my wife and I, uh, when we first started, we we're the only ones doing this. I was the main guy doing it for the longest time, but we eventually got big enough to where she had to help, you know, with planting and harvesting and stuff like that. And we, the two of us together were an absolute planting machine. I mean, we're two of the fastest planters on the face of the earth. And it's because <laughs> without saying anything to each other, we would make modifications to the process. And what, you know, the other one would recognize the fact that that change was being made and roll with it. And we'd see how it would go. Sometimes it would be a train wreck. Other times it would be like, wow, we just saved probably 20 minutes, you know, on planting these however many trays, mm -hmm. you know? So it was like, it was worth going down that road and trying different things each week to see what worked better. And it allowed us to really get super efficient about how we plant. Um, I mean, we could knock out, you know, a hundred trays in maybe 30, 40 minutes, you know, by hand, hand spreading every single one by, you know, soil hand leveling, uh, all that fun stuff. So it was like really crazy how fast we were able to get because we just took that time you know, to experiment and try different yeah, methods on things. So I would for sure. encourage if you're listening, do the same, man. I don't care if you've been doing this for a long time, you know, try seeding a different way, try spreading soil a different way. You know, there's always ways to improve. And if you save five seconds on every single trade, you've got hundreds of trades, oh, that's yeah. hours and hours and hours a year that you're saving. So, yeah. you know, it's worth it because the time is money and this business, especially. Yeah. And time, more importantly than time, I think t t like time is money, but time is time and you can't get yeah. your time back. Like, so if yep. you can do things more efficiently, um, like it, 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 your time is in, in my opinion, the most valuable resource you have, cause it's the most limited, yeah. like in theory, you can make unlimited money, you know, but you, yeah. you can't make unlimited time. You can be as healthy as you can, but you can't like just magically <laughs> like, who knows, maybe, maybe AI will like figure out, we'll like Futurama, take our brains and put it in a glass jar and, and like, you know, well, like, I don't know, I, I'm just going to assume that that's not the case. Cause I, who, like, we don't have self-driving cars yet. Like really, like yeah, we exactly. do, but not really. So I'm like, you know, I'm a little hesitant. Like, are we going to be able to move human consciousness outside of the human body? That, yeah. That's a whole other, that that's a different podcast, but um, like <laughs> knowing that like time is the most valuable resource. How do you want to spend it? And how can you like, get more of your time back to do whatever it is you want to do, grow the business, spend time with family, go on vacation. Um, so if you could do things more efficiently, that that's a huge win uh, in, in my yeah. book. So if you just keep moving forward in that direction um, each, each week, each month, each year, then you have a, a, a better, more uh, profitable, but also more time efficient business for yourself. Yeah. Um, as we, as we, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I just said 100%. I, I completely agree. I mean, that's yeah. that's what we shoot for all the time is efficiency yeah. all the time. For sure. Um, as, as we get close to wrapping up, um, I'd love to hear if you can go back to when you started your business in May 2020 and meet the younger <laughs> Andy, what advice would you give him to set him up for success? It's, it's definitely... Uh, that's the one challenging thing because there's there's a lot of things that we did really well. Um, and there's a lot of things we didn't do really well. I would say, number one, you know, try and find resources that you know are reliable, spend the time figuring it out if they're reliable or not. Uh, and, you know, that could be a something as simple as just joining a Facebook group and asking questions. You know, you're not bothering anybody. There's plenty of guys out there that are more than happy to, to reply but then vet those replies, <laughs> yeah. you know, ask that person, yeah. well, how long have you been doing this? How long have you been growing broccoli? How long have you been doing sorrel or whatever, you know, find out from them. And then that way you can at least know you've got a good answer because there's a lot of bad advice out there being given by, and it, it's not bad advice from their standpoint. It's what they learned from somebody else that also gave them bad advice, you know? So just, you know, I would say that for sure. And then number two, I would probably say, you know, is, just bypassing the home delivery and try and shoot straight for bigger clients, you know, like restaurants, especially um, it's 
I, I learned this lesson literally back then. Uh, we got into a uh, farmer's, like a harvest dinner kind of thing. And it's a local thing they do every single year and it's all local products. So the whole entire meal is it's made by this really awesome restaurant that's near us. And everything on the plate is all from local farms, which is really cool. Yeah, that's and awesome. I'd never heard of it. And then they actually reached out to us our first year. And I was like, oh, this is freaking awesome. So I think we were doing maybe 50 trays a week at this point. So it was only you know about not even two racks or just over two racks. And they wanted 75 trays worth of you know this one mix that we do. And I was like, it takes me all day to do 50 trays by myself. This is going to take me like two and a half days to harvest all this stuff. <laughs> So I was a little worried because I was the only guy harvesting at the time. And, but it was all eight ounce containers, you know, the big 64 fluid ounce containers that they all wanted. So I'm sitting, I started with that first thing. I thought, okay, let me just get this out of the way. It's going to take me probably the whole day just to do these two and a half hours later, I was done. And I thought, how in the heck is that possible? I just did 75 trays in two yeah. hours, two and a half hours. And it takes me all day to do 50 trays. And then it clicked. I wasn't filling one ounce packs, two ounce packs, one and a half ounce packs. I was filling large packs and I could grab a huge chunk at once and drop it in. And I have to constantly close the container, put a label on, you know, it was one label for every four packs basically yeah. versus having to do it, you know, in, in two ounce packs. So that's when I kind of realized, oh my gosh, this is why you shoot for the bigger clients because you're harvesting larger packages and it takes significantly less time you know, yeah. to do that. So even with grocery stores, I mean, it's the same thing. Like number one, you're already selling it to them at wholesale. So you're selling it to them for less than you would be selling it retail to your own customers. But now you're also harvesting small packages over and over and over again. And it just takes forever, you know, going that route. So I would say initially, you know, be diverse at least because you never know when the pandemic is going to happen again, God forbid, and all the restaurants shut down a second time. If you're all restaurants and you're going to be in, in really yeah. tough shape, but, um, you know, it's still don't wait to go after stuff like that. You know, get yourself up and running, make sure you can grow consistently and then, you know, go for those bigger fish. I, I would, I would advise. That's pretty much my, if I could go back and tell four year ago and yeah. what to do, that's what I would say. <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, I, I think the, the, uh, like similarly, uh, uh, I had a similar experience where like, I, I, like a lot of people think that I, because I recommend doing direct to consumer to start that I did direct to consumer to start, but I actually didn't. But um, I took a lot longer period of growing without selling before starting yeah. to sell. So it, it's a, like what I what I suggest uh, people do is like you, you can go either route, but like you can make money going the direct to consumer route, getting the practice. Then once you're ready, start making a, a, a slow switch to whatever it is, grocery or, or restaurants or yeah. distributors, whatever path, uh, you know, has opportunity, but also is the path you want to take. Um, but the the the. What's nice is that you can make money at the beginning without having to like constantly grow stuff. So you use that um, the direct to consumers practice for the next stage of of the business. So it could be for two months, it could be for three months, it it could be for six months, whatever makes sense for you. But it allows you to make money from I don't want to say day one, but pretty close to day one, like within a month of yeah. day one. Um, yeah. So, and, and then, yeah, I totally agree. Like moving to the bigger customers makes sense. It's, it's not like a, you know, I, I, I haven't seen a farm that does direct to consumer and does like a thousand deliveries, oh, you yeah, know, no. like, like <laughs> it, it probably, it might exist, but like, I personally haven't seen it yet. Usually like you realize it's less scale, it's easier to start less scalable. And then you move to what's more scalable as time goes on. Cause you recognize, okay, I can do this in two and a half hours instead of, and do like make three times as much money in, in the yep. same amount of time, you know? <laughs> so it's just, uh, it's a lot more efficient, uh, that way for sure. And, and restaurants are great because they're much higher margin, um, that people don't realize, yeah. like if you're selling to grocery stores, um, it's great cause you can move a lot of volume, but the margins are, are quite a bit lower than, than restaurants. Yeah. Um, yeah, but diversity and, and, and is usually the best strategy. Yeah. And that's a mistake I see in a lot of new growers doing as well as they assume, I'm selling wholesale to restaurants. you absolutely do not do that. <laughs> you know, a lot of people think, oh, if I just talk to the chef, I need to come up with wholesale pricing. No, you don't. I mean, they're not reselling your product. Yeah. And yeah. there's a high probability that they're paying significantly more already for the stuff that they are getting from a local distributor. They're probably paying twenty or thirty dollars for an eight ounce pack and versus you being able to sell it great. for less than that. So, you know, they're gonna get a, a fresher product for cheaper, most likely. So don't, yeah, there's no reason to give restaurants wholesale. Yeah. No way. So I sure. see a lot of new growers going in with that mindset and, you know, 
hopefully we can help kind of break that mindset because yeah you're just losing money i mean you're throwing yeah. money away that they would be more than willing to pay already yeah it's always good to go and find out what they're paying so like do the detective work find yeah. out what they're paying because like you know it, it, it's it's not a bad thing to for it to be lower than what they're paying but if it's like half the price um it, it, you're, you're, the, you're leaving money on the table right so yeah. just doing yep. doing proper market research is, is really important before you start selling to make sure you know <laughs> the the pricing in your local area so that you're not overshooting uh and, and yeah. not getting customers and not undershooting and losing uh, uh you know a lot of potential profit there um yep but yeah this has been a, a great episode lots of great insight if listeners want to connect with you and learn more about you and your farm, where can they find you on uh, online and on social media? Yeah, so um, you can go on to Facebook, find me under A Musaw, so at A Musaw, or you can just search Andy Musaw on there too. I'm pretty sure I'm the I'm, I'm the verified one. <laughs> <laughs> so if you find the verified Facebook account, that's Andy Musaw, that'd be me. On Instagram and uh, uh, YouTube, it's just Andy Musaw, so the whole thing, uh, all one word. And um, I'm trying to think of what else. Oh, and if you want to find our farm, so it's just at Fresh Source Farms on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I don't really have much beyond that. I do have a YouTube channel for it, but it's really not much. I just post like videos every once in a long while. <laughs> so I focus a lot more on my own personal stuff than anything else. But for sure. uh, a lot of stuff I post is public. I post a lot of videos about the farm, uh, you know, on both Instagram and my Facebook page as well. So you can kind of see what's going on there. And then obviously Urban Ag Academy, go to school, uh, school.com, S-K-O-O-L.com and search for Urban Ag Academy. You can find us in there. Uh, with Josh Shaver and uh, Robert Meredith as well. And then Farm Flow is a big thing. We do that too. There's a group on Facebook uh, called Farm Flow Microgreens Management Software or something like that. Uh, but you can just go to gofarmflow.com. So gofarmflow.com. That'll take you right to a information page. Uh, we do 30 days for free. So you can sign up and try it awesome. out. If you hate it, great. Don't pick a billing plan. It'll <laughs> shut off automatically after 30 days. If you love it, pick a billing plan and it still won't charge you until those 30 days are done. So uh, that way you can kind of test it out it's it does a ton you know so go in knowing that it's going to take time to set up there's a very good detailed video where i go through the whole process of getting everything set up so if you have any questions you can watch that video or reach out to me directly uh but that's kind of our uh our, that's how we keep ourselves sane i mean yeah it oh, literally yeah. allows me to sleep at night <laughs> <laughs> yeah no like any farm that's not using fa like some sort of farm management software uh should yep. really like like you know tr try tr try farm flow try uh, like whatever works for you and and try yeah. it and uh and it's definitely something that you know i recommend people have farm management software i use farm management software I, I don't know any of the bigger farms that don't like there's a few that don't but like it becomes uh very risky because like you have an employee that misses one planting because it was unclear that an email you sent them got missed or something about an order change yep. um you know that right there could pay for a year's subscription to uh to farm management software so it just it makes a whole lot of sense to not be doing things by hand at this point in time like these softwares exist if they didn't exist do it by hand but they exist so like <laughs> utilize what's yeah. available and and, and just no save yourself a lot of time and uh and and costly mistakes um is, is the yeah. big one in my opinion yeah. awesome because I mean, it's got task management in there we can add and it's not just pulling tasks based on what you need to do in your farm. That's a separate section. This is literally you saying every six months, I want to be reminded to change the filter in my air conditioning unit every week. I want to be reminded to, you know, wipe off the, the outside of my dehumidifier or what, I mean, you can literally, it's unlimited. Uh, you can set things to be running every day, every week, every two weeks, every three weeks. You can choose the day of the week you want them to run on, uh, all this kind of stuff. So literally my guys go in. That's the first thing they check is the task list. What needs to be done today? Yeah. And they have to check everything off as they go through the process, including watering so they don't forget to water. <laughs> you know, same with watering flowers and all that kind of stuff. It's all built in. Uh, inventory management's built in as well. So you can add in whatever products that you're consuming on a regular basis, all the way down to toilet paper, you know, coffee, uh, creamer, whatever, you know, you put all that stuff in there and it gets checked on a regular basis. That way you never run out of anything uh, because that's another big issue that you see people all the time. Like, oh crap, I don't have any sunflower seed. Can somebody hook me up? Or you know, cause they literally ran out of seed or ran out of packaging or ran out of soil, you know, God forbid, or something like that. So it's kind of a way of, you know, staying ahead of that whole process. Um, and even with seed, you can actually pick how far out you want to be notified. So we have it as 12 weeks. 
So once the system realizes we're about 12 weeks away from running out of seed, I start getting notifications, you know, to order more seeds. I guess be three months to source that seed, yeah. you know, just in case it's like sold out everywhere or I got to, you know, buy it from uh, moms, which I love moms. Don't get me wrong. But in the United States, it takes about a month, you know, from start to finish to get the seed. So we want to make sure we have plenty of time. Yeah. Uh, and it even has in uh, built in like a, a buffer percentage, as we call it. So we have ours set to 15%. And so when it's calculating how many trays you need to actually plant, it, you can have it add that extra percentage in there. So that way, if you have a problem with a tray or you had to throw something away or somebody dropped a tray, God forbid, you know, then it actually has that buffer kind of built yeah. into where, you know, you're getting more than what you actually need. Um, so all that stuff is in there. It does so much more than that. I mean, all the gap certification stuff for the United States is all in there. Cleaning records, temperature records, uh, pest records, you name it. I mean, we're gap certified. So we have all that stuff in there for us to use. You can add team members, you can add training modules. I mean, it's just ridiculous how much this thing can do. So go check it out. Go farmflow.com. Uh, it's a great video on there showing how it works. And then, uh, like I said, 30 days for free. If you hate it, move on. We don't care. I mean, awesome. rather at least you try it and see if you like it. Yeah. I mean, it's not the end of the world. We're using it every single day. So if it doesn't work, then that's a problem for us. Uh, and obviously everybody else that's using it every day too. So, and I've, I've been a web programmer since the nineties. I mean, literally since the internet became a thing, you know, this has been my world, uh, forever. So, uh, high end web applications. That's what I've done for decades at this point. So it was a no brainer to build this and put it together. Yeah. But yeah, we try and keep it cheap too, for the same reason. We want people to be, people to be able to afford it. For sure. Uh, I think that's important. Yep. Awesome. So, awesome. Yeah, give it a try. Yeah, for sure. Check it out. Thanks so much, Andy, for coming on. This was a great episode. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Thanks for tuning in to the Mike Regan's Mastery Podcast. To access a wealth of insights, just click the subscribe button, stay notified about each new episode, and enjoy all of this wisdom for free. If you're ready to supercharge your microgreens business, visit microgreensconsulting.com for a gold mine of guides and resources. We've transformed thousands of microgreens businesses and you're invited to join the success story. Let's stay connected. Follow us on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Microgreens Consulting for exclusive content and expert tips and wisdom. If you found this episode insightful, please leave us a review, spread the word, and let's share microgreens magic with the world. Until next time, let curiosity fuel your growth and may happiness be your harvest. Happy growing, everyone.